And this is the same company that I started working for. And then three months later, he fired me. I feel safer in Dubai than I do in Europe. Look at what's going on in Europe right now. How long did it take you to become like a good agent? anywhere between one to two years. Do you think it's easier? I think a lot of people are sold the dream and they come over just expecting to make big money straight away. Today on the podcast, I got the owner and CEO of Elite Properties. They're a boutique award-winning real estate agency here in Dubai. And this is the same company that I started working for when I moved to Dubai in July. And then three months later, he fired me and we'll get a little a little more into that later on in the podcast, but Jake Jones, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Yeah, man, it's awesome, man. Yeah. You know, when I started working for, for you in July, I, uh, I just thought you were so cool, and every time I just wanted to hang out with you, I wanted to talk to you, but you know, you were so busy running around, running the businesses, and I was just like a little nervous every time I was around <laughs> you because I just thought you were so cool. But So I'm just super grateful that you're here and I, I get to talk to you for like an hour, hour and a half. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, I've been watching your, watching your story online, following your socials, it's going very good. So Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. thanks. It's been crazy, man. Yeah. But I want to get right into like a very interesting topic because when I moved to Dubai, I was so looking into real estate agents and how mm. much they can make. And obviously, you're probably the best person to answer that question because you've hired like probably almost 100 real estate agents and, and you actually pay their salary. So say you become like a top 10, top 20% real estate agent in Dubai, how much is it possible to make consistently every month? So first off, there's no salary. So it's all commission only. Um, we do pay obviously higher commission than the standard kind of 50-50 in the market. Um, but yeah, I mean, how much do they, do you mean how much they can earn or? Yeah, like what, what is the possibilities for them to like get in the pocket every month consistently? Um, I mean, a good strong, strong agent should be hitting the 100,000 dirham target every month. Okay. Um, but you know, on average, we, we have an annual target of 1.2 million a year. That's the target? Yeah. So, but, so, so say they hit the 100,000 dirham target per month. Mm. Then they split it 50-50 with the agency, right? Yeah, that's that's standard, but some agencies pay more, you know, okay. 60, 65 percent. Okay. So yeah. if they're making a hundred thousand dirhams a month, uh, yeah. they split it fifty fifty, so they're left with fifty thousand a month. Yeah. So that in dollars, that's about thirteen thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Is it is it possible if you become like the top ten percent? you're just selling consistently like crazy. Is there any agents that are making like forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 every month? Yeah, I mean, that you've got you've got the top kind of five to 10% that are doing way more than that. You yeah. Know, 200, 300,000, mm -hmm. you no know, more than that a month on average. Um, you know, I know agents in the market, very, very few, but there is some agents in the market that do, you know, 10 to 20 million dirhams in commission. That's a year, crazy. which yeah is is crazy money. That's yeah. kind of the top the top one or two percent, I would say. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess this you know you've probably heard about like the eighty twenty rule. Yeah. Where and this is probably very uh, applies very well for being an agent in Dubai. That like twenty percent of the agents make eighty percent of the commission. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you know true. if if you if you if you say you come to Dubai, you you haven't developed your sales skills yet. It's going to be very hard to, you know, start selling very consistently. But you, I guess you need a lot of time to get good at this. Or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it, it takes, you know, it can take five to six months to really start, you know, start doing transactions, start building your network. You know, a lot of people come over from the UK or from Europe. They think, you know, they see Dubai, they see the kind of flashy lifestyles that people are living and they think they're going to just make, you know, $100,000 in, in their first year. Mm -hmm. It's not like that, you know, it's more more gradual. Um, so it can take, you know, four to six months to, to start doing sales mm -hmm. as a real estate agent. Uh, some agents, you know, do, do do that a lot quicker. But I think a lot of people are sold the dream and they come over just expecting to make big money straight away. Um, it doesn't quite work like that. You know, they don't have the patience. Um, and you kind of, you have to go through a lot, a lot of failures and a lot of, you know, months of sometimes not doing any deals, you know, learning your trade, learning the craft um, before you start, you know, put doing it, doing the big numbers and hitting target. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, man. So what about elite properties? How, just to understand, you know, your business a little bit better. So how, how, how many apartments did you sell 2023? Do you have that number? 
2023, how many apartments did we sell? <laughs> um, 2023, I mean, we did just, just under a one, one billion in property value in okay. sales. Um, and we, we're now, you know, nearly, nearly three years old. And mm. We're touching on, you know, three, three billion dirhams worth of property value sold. Um, for, you know, we're still a boutique agency. Um, so really we have, you know, 20 to 25 agents at the moment. Okay. Um, so we're still quite, quite a small company. Yeah. Um, still, still growing, but we don't want to be, you know, too, too big, like, you know, 100, mm. 150 agents. We're trying to keep to, you know, quality over quantity. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. I, I heard, I saw somewhere you won uh, the Boutique Agency of the Year Award. Yeah, correct. Well, who gives out this reward and why did you win it? So that was with Bayou and the Bizzle, uh, uh -huh. 2022. We voted the best boutique agency in Dubai. Um, and I think it was just, you know, it was just truth. They they saw that, you know, we were, the the rate we grew, you know, we started in 2021, mid 2021, um, to kind of, our reputation and brand grew so quickly yeah. um, in the market. So they, they recognized us, you know, it was mm -hmm. nice to be recognized by obviously such a big portal. Um, but we also, we're also voted by the people um, for that award. So yeah. we got the most votes out of any of the oh. boutique agency. Yeah. Boutique. This is a word I didn't know before I saw, saw this award. But boutique yeah. means like a small company, right? Yeah. I got I mean, you're, you're kind of a boutique in uh, sublease. Anyway. Really? Yeah. yeah okay. It's, it's a nice word. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a good it's, word. It's better than like small real estate. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah. And boutique is a lot nicer. Exactly. And clients like that because I think they, they have more of a, they feel like they get a better service with a boutique. More Because they feel that more personal um, as opposed to, you know, a massive agency where there's, you know, corporation of two, 300 agents are like, well, I'm not going to get yeah. you know, the kind of personalized service I might be forgotten about. Mm -hmm. So being a boutique, I think in this market is, is, you know, strong yeah. point. I saw you were on the phone right before the podcast. Were you talking to one of your clients? Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. Always on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gotta be. Shit, man. <laughs> so, so tell me, you said you sold like 2 million. No, how, how, how much did you sell? Just last under year? 1 billion dirhams worth. 1 of property value, yeah. billion dirhams. And the, in dollars, such big numbers, I can't even put it in my calculator. Yeah. <laughs> in dollars, how's Matt? How much is that? It's like 250 million yeah, dollars. Probably, yeah. And then your company takes like two to 5% commission out of that. Yeah. I mean, it can go up to 7% commission. Really? Um, there was a point where it was going up to 8%, but now developers have started to reduce commission slightly because the market is so strong. Um, so normally developers increase the commission when the market's not you know, mm. selling as, as quickly as it, as it has been. When oh. the market get, becomes very strong and they, you know, they don't need to pay high commission, the developer starts to, I got to lower the commissions. So how, how is the market right now? Is it strong? Yeah, I think still, still very, very strong, still a lot of momentum. Um, we're not seeing so many Russian buyers moving into the market now, but I'd say there's a lot more um, Chinese buyers transacting. And to be honest, over the last... 11 years that I've been in Dubai, I'm nearly 12 years That's now. That's crazy, by the way. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's always been, I mean, whether it was, you know, the Brits, whether it was the Indians, whether it was the Russians, there's always a different nationality where is is buying, you know. So I say to the team all the time, you know, don't worry if, you know, if the market starts to slow down, if the Russians stop buying or Chinese stop buying, there's going to be another nationality because... Dubai is never going to lose the, you know, as long as, long as it's sunny here, as long as the tax still stays very low, um, as long as the lifestyle is still good, there's always going to be mm. people wanting to move here. That's the important thing. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Mm. So, are you, you are you the only owner, or there your partners in the company, or yeah, partners. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So my partners are Aaron Leo and Sahela Moldina. Um, originally, we were working at another award-winning agency before we started. Okay. Um, and I mean, Aaron, I've known for nearly. 13 or 14 years now. So we actually yeah. went to university together. Oh, in London? In, in, in Leeds in the Leeds. UK. Yeah, so we actually met at university. Wow. And did you move to Dubai together or or just was it just a coincidence? Yeah, so I, I moved. I was actually looking at, you know, London or Dubai before, before I moved over um, after university. And it was just, it was so clear to me that there was so much more opportunity in Dubai than there yeah. was London. You know, at the time, looking back, you know, London was very, very saturated. Um, they kind of, you know, as a graduate, when you leave university, they're looking for people that have got 
five or six years experience you know with, mm. for a graduate job and you're like how am i how am i supposed to get five or six years experience you know yeah. for a graduate job it doesn't make sense and were you trying to become a real estate agent in london i was looking at the yeah the real estate oh. market um, but then when you looked at you know like the salary they were paying the commission is a lot lower in the uk i mean you can I think in the UK the commission is crazy. Like you, you sell a property and the commission might be like a thousand pounds or or less than that, which is. <laughs> so so the agency only charges that, or does the agent just get a, such a small cut? Yeah, the agent because so because because uh, they get a good um, basic salary, mm. car, you know, all of the perks. So the commission oh, okay. is a lot lower. How much? So sell, say you sell your apartment in London. How much percentage do you have to pay the the agency? If you sell so. I think they still have a 2% commission. Similar to here. Yeah, similar. Um, but yeah, just, you know, when you weighed up all the costs of, you know, if you're living in London, okay, I've got to pay oh. so much on rent, so much on public transport, mm. 40%, 45% tax. I was looking at the numbers, I was like, you know. You just saw the lifestyle was going to be a lot better. Yeah, yeah. the lifestyle and in also, you know, the earning potential here in Dubai. You know, yeah, you can sky's earn, the limit. <laughs> yeah, if you have a few good years in Dubai, I mean, it, it would take you ten or twelve years to do that in you know yeah. in London or some parts of the UK. Mm. So, are you from Leeds? No, I'm from uh, Loughborough, which is a small town um, close to Nottingham. Mm. Yeah. Okay, you know it? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I've heard I've heard about Nottingham. Nottingham. Obviously, I'm not from the UK. I'm from Iceland. So, yeah. But uh, all right. So so. So what did you study in, in the university? So I studied international business and management at mm. university. Um, so it was kind of like I, I knew I didn't want to be in the UK. So that's why I studied international oh. business. And it kind of gave me a broad um, range of options. So I knew when I finished university, I would be able to go into, into business. And, mm. But I, mainly I didn't want, really want to be in the UK anymore. I gotcha. Mm. And so did you always knew you were going to be get into real estate agency or you're just thinking real estate in general or so yeah my dad my dad's an architect um in the uk so i've always been you know as a younger a younger man i was also working with my dad you know helping him out so i was always kind of involved in the real estate business um i was even a plumber at one point <laughs> so yeah so when i when i left school i was actually in plumbing and doing manual labor working on building sites Mm. um you know get up at 6 a.m in in the cold rain in the uk oh shit, doing yeah. the kind of hands-on work and yeah i mean i quickly realized that i was i was better with my mouth and you know dealing yeah. with customers than fixing houses and there's also there's also a lot more money in selling houses than mm. fixing them you know really yeah sometimes i think you know these plumbers especially if you make like a plumbing business that's pretty lucrative too though isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. Be. Yeah, in, in Europe and the UK, you, you can you can have a very good uh, yeah. business with you know plumbing or electricians, yeah. any kind of manual labor. It's it's very mm. good. It's not like not like here in in Dubai. Oh yeah, because the labor is so cheap here and so competitive. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So did you do any other jobs in in the UK before you came to Dubai, or was it just the plumbing for a little bit? And yeah, that was the plumbing. And I basically so that was during the so I had my own plumbing business um, here. I, no, that was in the UK. Oh, so, yeah. oh, you had your own plumbing yeah, business yeah. in the UK. Yeah, oh. so when I was when I was in the UK, so when I was eighteen, I started that. Wow. Um, yeah, so from a young age, I was you know already kind of looking at setting up businesses. I was yeah. always been very entrepreneurial, um, and I basically the recession hit in you know two thousand and eight, and people just stopped building, oh. so construction really slowed down. Mm. So obviously, having my own business at that age, um, I was kind of like you know what do I do? Um, that's why I decided to go back to university. I thought, okay, the recession is probably going to take, you know, three, four years before we come out of recession in the UK. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a good chance to go back to university, learn more about business and management, because I knew that's that's what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't want to be kind of working on the tools all my life. You know, when you mm -hmm. get older, you've got a bad back, yeah, sore yeah. knees. Yeah. So I kind of, I, I wanted to, you know, yeah. study a bit more because I, I, I felt like I left school, you know, too early for yeah. various reasons. Um, so I, I went back to university and that's when I was, you know, kind of figuring out, okay, what do I want to do? You feel like that, uh, that degree helped you at all? Or? <sighs> so very good for experience, you know, life experience, yeah. university is very good for. In terms of network, yes, you know, I've made some, some good contacts that I'm still in touch with. Um, but in terms of business, I mean, I learned 
I mean, as soon one more year in Dubai, as soon as I moved to Dubai and, you know, one year or two years of living, living in Dubai, I learned way more yeah, exactly. in that time frame than I did. At you university. think maybe it would have been better if you just came to Dubai two years earlier and yeah, skipped the school? Definitely. So it's, yeah. it's funny actually, because I actually came to Dubai in 2006 mm. on holiday. So I was, I think I was just under, yeah, I was, I was around 18 at the time when I came on holiday for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, Burj Khalifa was, was built, the structure was there, but it wasn't finished. So the, the glass was still not on, on the building wow. for the Burj Khalifa. That's when you came for a visit for the first time? Yeah, for the first time. Marina, I don't, I don't even remember going to the marina on that trip. So I don't even think the marina was like a thing back then. Uh, it was like 2006, right? So yeah. Um, Burj Khalifa wasn't finished and then you know when you you get that kind of instinctive like my my gut feeling was I knew this yeah. place was going to be you know very very good for business in the future and that yeah. kind of stayed with me you know at that age but at, at that time I, I was too young to, to stay. How old in. were you then? Uh, just over 18. And then when, what? how old were you when you actually made the move to Dubai? So I made the move after university uh, I just turned 24. And that's when you just applied for a job as a real estate agent? Yeah. For with with, with what company? So it was a company called Smith and Ken. Okay. Um, so I actually went to an open day that they they had in London. Um, went to that and then yeah, decided kind of I I was between that and financial sales. So mm. I also had an interview at Devere, Devere, um, which is financial sales. Mm. Uh, it's now called Devere Acuma, I believe. Mm. Um, and yeah, I was between those two, um, but I decided going to real estate because it was more tangible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was, I was selling something, you know, selling villas and apartments. It was, I felt it was more tangible than selling, you know, financial investments. Oh, yeah. Mm. So selling financial investments, so just like selling stocks and stuff like that. Yeah, that was like, you know, savings plans and, mm. you know, so I, 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 and obviously with, you know, working for my dad with an architect, I had more experience in real estate already. Mm. So I just felt more comfortable in yeah. going into that. Makes sense. Yeah. So, so how was the, how, how long did it take you to become like a good agent when you moved to Dubai? <sighs> good question. Um, I, I personally believe it takes anywhere between one to two years. And how long did you do it in? Two months? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I yeah, within four months, I, I hit Diamond Club. Um, with what the does that mean? Yeah, so Diamond, Diamond Club. Club was, it was a thing in the company where once you'd, you'd done over 250,000 dirhams in a month, okay. um, you hit Diamond Club and, you know, you got, they bought you a suit or some sort of, you know, nice. incentive. So Yeah, that's what I like about. You know, even when I, I when I started working with you and there was mm. all of these, you told me about all these like incentive structures and bonuses and yeah. everything, my eyes just lit up. I was like, oh, because yeah. there's so much competition and I love that so much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, do you think it's easier, it was easier then than it is now? No, not all. I mean, here's the thing, like we, we were looking at back then, people would say, okay, um, you know, it was a... 2013 right so when we started off as agents and the, the senior agents before us were in the company you know they started in like 2008 maybe 2009 or some even 2006 mm -hmm. um and we would say that then we were like oh yeah you know these guys are only good because they started back then when it was easier oh now it's the same thing right so we you know the senior guys at elite we're we're there and we see the young people come in and they're coming up to us, you know, talking, asking for advice. And they're like, yeah, but, you know, you guys started when it was a lot easier. Mm. But it, it wasn't at all. It, it, was actually, it was actually a lot harder because back then you had to convince people that Dubai was oh. a good place to live. It was a safe place to invest. Oh. It was, you know, no, Dubai wasn't famous. Yeah, now everybody knows it's fine. Yeah, now, it's established. Since, since COVID, you know, since... Um, you know, kind of social media. When, I, I think during COVID, everyone coming to Dubai on holiday, you know, celebrities, influencers, putting it on social media, it kind of became like world famous. Yeah. So many people started moving here. Obviously, you've seen what happened to, you know, to the market and prices increasing. So, yeah, yeah. I, now it's everybody knows Dubai. Everybody yeah. knows it's a good place to invest. Back mm. then, it, you know, you, you really had to convince people to, mm. to, to make an investment here. One thing I want to talk, ask you, uh, so for me, some people like, because I'm subleasing apartments in Dubai, I mm -hmm. rent apartments long term, and then I put on Airbnb and Booking.com and try to make a profit. Yeah. Some people ask me if I'm ever going to buy apartments in Dubai. Like I, I bought some apartments in Iceland and yeah. I'm really comfortable with the Iceland market because I just understand it so well. Mm -hmm. Like 
there's a lot of people that want to move there or like a lot, you know, relatively. And, you know, it's not a lot being built. You know, I just understand it so well. But Dubai, I, I just, I don't understand it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trust buying as much in Dubai as I would in Iceland, you yeah. know, because what if, you know, because we, we, we don't have volcanoes here though. True. There's no volcanoes. <laughs> there was a volcano in Iceland just recently and one house went, went under the lava no and way. then the lava stopped. It oh, was only one house. It's so crazy. I was, I was going to ask you that because Go ahead. volcano, you know, I know obviously you're, you're very successful in Iceland with your, your Airbnb business and I've seen the news lately about volcanoes. I was always thinking, okay, I wonder how Bergfors yeah. getting on with his bookings or what, what are you, what are you doing in this, mm. this period? So the thing is, you know, it's not like a crazy explosion volcano. It's mm. just a little lava coming out of the ground, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's one town that's very close to the lava. Yeah. There's like a season now in one area where they just, volcano pops up and then it stops. It mm. pops up again and then it stops and in different locations. So it's very dangerous, dangerous for that town and the Blue Lagoon that's yeah. in the area. But the airport and the city that all my apartment's in, they're completely safe. It's like they're so far away from this area, so it's fine. Yeah. But the thing is, these volcanoes, it's it kind of scares tourists a little bit. So you do see when the eruption comes, I can see, you know, there's a little more cancellations in my mm. Airbnb apartments. Yeah. There's a little less bookings. Yeah. But sometimes the, the volcano is so safe and there's so much media around it and it's so pretty that it actually helps the tourism, that people... Mm. And you can actually go and see it. You can walk up to it oh, okay. and you can see it. So yeah. sometimes it actually just helps. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's the story with the volcanoes. Yeah. <laughs> but but <laughs> but uh, but I wanted to understand and get your opinion because because yeah. Dubai it has you know nine percent of the people that live here are are expats. They come from other countries to live here. Mm. And what I would be scared of, and I want you to debunk that, is if something would happen here, just you know. Black Swan, I don't know, one bomb goes off somewhere or something. Everybody would have such an easy time fleeing back home. Mm. And then there's so many empty apartments versus Iceland and probably UK. People don't have a place to flee to. They they are more likely to stay. Mm. What do you think about that? Is that a risk or? I mean, going back. So for me, like now, I think it's the first time in you know centuries where I feel safer in Dubai than I do in Europe. I mean, look at what's going on in Europe right now in terms of wars and stuff like that. So yeah. mm. I would feel more worried about bombs going off in the UK or places like this, you know, where than, than Dubai. Yeah. I think I think because years ago, 2013, 2014, there was the war, you know, in Iraq. So obviously back then it was like, hey, is Dubai safe? Yeah. You know, you worry about what's what's going on so close. But now it's the opposite. I feel like that's, you know, that's going on in Europe. So mm -hmm. people come to Dubai for safety. I mean, you look at the look at the crime rate here. You know, compared to places like Amsterdam, London, Barcelona, yeah. the crime rate is it's you know, nothing. Yeah. So I think safety is one of the main the main reasons people move here. Mm -hmm. um, I get what you're saying. You know, what if everyone just leaves? Um, but I mean, what are the chances of that? You know, look at True. how flexible the you know the the king is here. Was you know creating new laws to always try to bring new businesses here, you know, always trying to boost the market with new, new regulations. It's, you know, it takes them one day to make a decision and they, they put a new law in, you know, yeah, can, that's the, that's crazy. Yeah. Man. Whereas in, you know, the UK, they've got a parliament, it takes years to make any changes. To make any changes. So yeah, I just think if you look at how old Dubai is, I mean, Dubai is what, 25, 30 years old now. Um, what, you know, from the, the real estate market, like, what's what's happened in that time frame you know it's so so it's grown so quickly so strong um where you know it's competing with cities like london new york which are you know i don't know 500 years old yeah so you know. yeah the dubai market is yeah it has a lot more potential yeah the other thing i think about is what about like this scarcity because it feels like they can build so much so easily so fast uh, yeah. versus, you know, when I look at Iceland, they have a very hard time building more apartments. So what about like the scarcity? You seem, you know, that's just, I don't know nothing about this, but it's mm. just what it comes to my mind. Yeah. What, what, what do you say about that? You know, when I say, you know, they, they just build more and more and it's, there's not a lot of scarcity. What do you say to that? 
So, I mean, the population's increasing so quickly as well, right? So, yeah. it, you know, th they're building so much because we, we need more supply you know, compared to demand. If yeah. you look at every single project which is, is being launched, um, you know, as long as it's in, in a pr prime location or, you know, by a, by a major developer, it's selling out within, you know, one day, two days. Yeah. So that's the reason why they, they keep launching. I guess also there's always going to be scarcity in the hot areas. You yeah. Know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, we focus mainly on the prime areas. So, you know, Dubai Hills, downtown, mm -hmm. Dubai Marina, these areas where, you know, now they're, they're, they are fully developed and they're always going to be, you know, the prime locations of Dubai. So mm -hmm. that's what, what we focus on. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that I always wonder is, you know, these new launches and, and they sell out within like minutes or hours. Yeah. What I, I just don't why why don't they just raise the price a little bit and sell it out over like one month or something? Why do they do it like that? That it just sells. Sometimes they do, yeah. So you, normally they start collecting EOIs, the developer. What is that? So expression of interest. Okay. Yeah, and then they they you know they're very clever the developers, so they they kind of test the waters with you mm. know collecting expressions of interest, seeing how many clients register, you know if there's huge amounts of demand for the pre-registration, then sometimes they do, you know, the developers increase the price by 5%. And they, they do that as well for, you know, next phases that come out in the project. So phase one might be at a certain price. Um, and then, you know, phase two, they will increase the prices. Phase three, prices are higher again. Um, so they're always increasing the prices. Mm. So it's always best for, you know, investors to get in right at the start with off-plan projects. Mm. Do you work like very closely with the, with the like Emar and Demac, the developers, the big developers. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're partnered with Emar, Demac, Nikhil, Morass, um, every major developer in Dubai, mm. um, also developers in the UK um, and across Europe. So we've got very strong partnerships. Um, we actually won number one with Emar uh, back in 2017 oh, yeah. uh, with our original company. Um, and then also number two in 2018. So across what does that world, mean? Like you sold the most, or yeah. So we we so out of every agency across the world, we we sold the most um, direct uh, stock with Emar properties. Uh, is Emar yeah. in more uh, countries than just Dubai? Yeah. So you've got agencies registered all across the world. Okay. So Emar is the biggest biggest developer in Dubai. For those that don't know. Yeah. Uh, so is Emar only building apartments in Dubai? Or are they also building in India or whatever? Yeah, they they've got projects in in oh. other countries as well. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So, so how does this relationship work between you and the developers? Do they just let you know personally when there's a hot launch coming, and then you tell your agents, and then the agents spread the word? Yeah, like exactly. So um, we always kind of you know down to relationships. You always we find out information on you know projects that are coming up in the future through relationships at, at the developers. Um, and then we kind of, you know, brief our, our closest clients on projects that we expect to be launched in, you know, the next quarter or, you know, the next six months. Um, we normally have a pipeline of clients ready to to buy in, in such projects. Um, and yeah, we, we basically, um, sorry, I was just thinking, what, what, what were we talking about then? Off we were plan. talking about <laughs> uh, off plan, Shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Off plan, um, yeah, projects. So the question was, how does yeah. it work, the relationship between you and the developers? Like, yeah. do, do you have like a contact that you just work with and they let you know as soon as they're a hot, there's a hot launch? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they, they, they let us know as soon as they're launching a project, they'll yeah. send out like, um, you know, a briefing invite for all of the agents. Mm. Um, and then we have to go to the briefing. So mm. all the agencies will, will go to the briefing. Find out all of the information, you know, such as the the brochures, the floor plans, the payment plan, you know, yeah. the key selling points for the project, and what's unique. Um, we find out everything, and then we go back to our clients um, and basically um, brief them on exactly, you know, what the new project is, why why it's good for investment, you know, and that. That's what. So, what are the benefits of buying off plan? So, off plan. Par apartments means that they're not ready yet they're not yeah. built yet or they're being built yeah w what are the benefits of buying those rather than just buying apartments that are already ready and you can rent out right away yeah so i mean the main benefit is you know a lot of people want new property as well so having a brand new property um never lived in 
obviously you get warranty as well mm. and then the the flexible payment plans that you can get with developers so it's kind of like having a savings plan um, where you're you know you're paying over a payment plan of maybe three to four years on a property instead of needing to get a mortgage mm. with a ready property you know a lot of buyers if they're not buying with cash they need to get a mortgage yeah so and then you know also the the potential for capital appreciation so a lot of the off-plan projects, especially projects which are selling out, you know, within one or two days from launching, um, investors can buy, you know, then just before handover, they, you know, they might sell or on handover and make make some capital appreciation. So usually you can get get like better deals, cheaper cheaper apartments. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah. depend depends on you know it's not always cheap, but depends on on the project. I got you. Um, some might be luxury or high end. Mm. Um, but yeah, normally it's down to flexibility mm. and you know. Being being a, a new project, having that that potential for capital appreciation as well. Mm, got it. Mm. So so, let's go back into your story a little bit. So you moved yeah. to Dubai. You started working with that real estate agency. You worked with it for like I don't know five, six, seven years. Yeah. So I, I was with the first agency for yeah just under three years. Mm. Yeah. And 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 in in these uh, wait, so you were with the first agency for three years, and then you switched agencies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, I, so 2015, I, I started working with another agency and we were mainly focused on off plan. And mm. um, so we, that, that's where our relationships really started with, you know, Imar, Morass, all of the major developers. Yeah. And it, it was such good timing because there was, there was a huge um, kind of trend of, of, you know, launching off plan. So mm. Imar were launching all of the, you know, projects that you see now in downtown or Dubai Hills where they're finished. Um, you know, you sold all that. We were, yeah. yeah, like Dubai Hills. We we started selling when it was, you know, plots mm. of sand and it was there was nothing there. So, so I remember you told me once that you were like you and Aaron were one of the best agents in these companies, and you were selling a lot. How how uh, how much were you meant to sell, and how how much commission were you getting over these over all of these years? Um, I mean, we you know between one hundred to one hundred and fifty million dirhams in property value over the mm. year. Um, I think got, my best year was just under two hundred million. 200 million dirhams in property value yeah. that you sold. You know I'm going to bring out the calculator. Yeah. <laughs> 200 million. So you sold properties for like $54 million yeah. I, uh, over what period of time? Uh, that was one year. That yeah. was one year. Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. So you were doing yeah. really good for, for a long time. Yeah. So that was, you know, very, very good year. Yeah. Um, now we're more focused on management and building the company. Yeah. Why um, did you go? Why did you? decide to start your own agency um good question so i, I think it, it comes a point in everyone's sales career especially where you know where, where you when you start believing that you you can do it better than the management you're working for yeah that's when you know you've got you've got the right amount of experience and um, you've got the right you've built up your network i feel like that's that's the right time to set up mm. you know because you, you you know when you you're young and you start off and you you don't really have the right experience you don't have the you don't understand the business enough to to do that straight away yeah. sometimes you can jump in but it might be a bit a bit risky yeah. then it comes a point in your instincts where you know okay now I know I can do it better than so than how these. long had you been an agent when you actually went and did that so I was an agent for t t t t eight or nine years before mm -hmm. I before I started Elite Property and then you teamed up with Aaron and yep. and you. Just say, all right, let's start our own. Yeah. And did you? So it was, it was basically during COVID. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, during the lockdowns where we were kind of sat inside, everyone was sat in their apartments, you know, yeah. in their villas. Um, we started creating ideas, you know, mm -hmm. we were like, and a, a lot of, a lot of companies were created in, you know, periods like that, right? In, yeah. In financial crises, you know, exactly. the lockdowns and COVID. Everybody had so much time to think. Yeah, we had more time to think. And, and we just started thinking, you know, we, we, wanted, we wanted to build a platform where, you know, experienced sales agents, you know, very, very hungry sales agents with, you know, experience in Dubai could basically just, you know, have a, a safe platform where you could trust, trust the owners mm -hmm. and, you know, do deals, make money. And that, that was all we wanted. You know, that was how the idea started. Um, and it just took off from there. You know, we started with four people mm. um, in a small office in, in Barsha Heights. So when you say four people, is that including the two of you? Yeah. So, yeah. so obviously, if you start your own real estate agency, the benefit is not only you can hire a bunch of people, 
you can just work in that agency yourself and you, then you don't have to split the commission with somebody else. Was that like the idea also a little bit to begin with or? Um, no, not really. I mean, we, we still, we still do deals through, you know, our, our private networks, okay. um, but not, you know, we, we're not, not mainly not focused on selling, but we still do the odd transaction here and there with our private networks. Um, mm. but we still split the commission with the company. Yeah. So, it's, it's oh yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was more about it was more about having control um, and transparency. So yeah. you know, having control over the marketing, having control over the finance, having control over you know day to day operations. Because when I was an agent, I I didn't agree with a lot of the decisions that the management were making. Like what above me? So I mean, it was just you know sometimes you would see the management spending money or investing on things that I just didn't see made sense. You know, I was, mm. as, as an agent, you're like okay why don't you put that money into marketing or property finder or generating leads? Because uh, at the end of the day, if you do that as an agent, we're going to get more leads. We're going to close more deals mm -hmm. and then it's going to be better off for the management. So I just, I just kind of lost trust in, in the management mm -hmm. and I thought, you know, I think I know better to what to do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, man, I love it. What, what, uh, so, so obviously you scaled that up to yeah. like 25, agents or whatever you have right now what yeah. what is like what what surprised you in that process like what were the biggest challenges doing that whole thing biggest challenges so i think marketing is you know marketing and software is is the biggest challenge i mean same you know obviously yeah. with holiday homes i think software is hugely hugely important with airbnb yeah. and you know price labs and all of the yeah. the tech that you use and I think I think that's the biggest challenge is just staying constantly updated every single day because you know technology is always changing, right? Mm. Um, I've noticed with you as well, like you're always changing your price lab settings, yeah. you're always testing, and I feel like that's what you, especially in you know Dubai, such a competitive market. I mean, yeah. four or five thousand real estate agencies alone just in this city. That's so crazy. Four thousand yeah. agencies, not yeah, agents. I mean, the agents, are, agencies. Who knows how many agents? I mean, you know, it's just yeah. without rearers and all of that as well. Uh, um, so I think marketing is a huge challenge because you've got such a saturated market. So mm. that that that's been very yeah. People, what surprised me the most when I moved to Dubai yeah. was how competitive like marketing and cold calling and everything yeah. like like that was nobody in Iceland is cold calling for real estate agencies. Yeah. Nobody. Mm. And I thought like, <laughs> actually, if I would have a real estate agency in Iceland and I would start cold calling, yeah. I would, I would kill it Yeah, because nobody else is doing it. People would just yeah. answer the phone and be like, Oh, you're a real estate agent, you know, yeah. but here, if you cold call somebody, they're just going to hang up right away because yeah. they're so tired of all the cold calling, <laughs> all the marketing. So I bet, yeah. I bet that was the yeah, challenge. That's hard. But I mean, you have to you have to do that you know cold calling and mm -hmm. you have to be on every single platform now so i think you know say that to our team all the time you have to be using every single avenue whether it's whatsapp whether it's emails whether it's social media whether it's cold calling mm. whether it's net to network face face to face meetings um, because your competition will be you know yeah. and you never know where you know you might catch you might not be able to get hold of someone with a call but then you can reach them on whatsapp or you can reach them on, on email you never know, right? Mm. So you've got to be on every single platform. So, so w is that the marketing you do, or do you like run ads or something? Yeah, like yeah, that we also? we run ads. Um, also, very big on on Property Finder as well. Um, oh yeah, so you pay Property Finder is the the uh, soft like the place where people go to mm. look at properties online. Yeah, and you pay them to have your properties on top, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Property Finder is you know the most dominant property portal yeah. in the Middle East. Um, very, 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 very good for generating leads. Um, you know, over the, the last 11 years I've been here, most of, most of my top clients come through property finder, you know, yeah. so, and it's the same with a lot of agents nowadays, they, they start in the market. They want to do, you know, social media, they want to try all these different, different tricks, you know, mm. but property finder will always deliver the best, the yeah, best leads. Yeah. So, so what, so since you're not like spending a lot of time selling properties yourself, mm. what, what does your day look like? I, I remember when I, I was working in your company for a while and yeah. you were just running around in your office on the phone always. Yeah. What, so what are you doing all day? <laughs> well, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean that, that's been, the, that's probably the most challenging thing actually talking about, you know, when you were going back to that point, you said, what's the most challenging thing is 
getting used to being a business owner yeah. from you know kind of that transition from being an agent where you're just thinking about your own targets you're thinking about your own sales you know your clients yeah. transitioning into a business owner where you you know you're dealing with every single part of the business operations finance marketing mm-hmm. that's very challenging because you know you get to work and you, you might have I might have a quite a clear schedule for the morning and then as soon as I get to the office there's you know some problems with some of the software or you know we need to yeah. do something operational so all right so what you talk about softwares they use as a real estate owner of a real estate agency, what what softwares are you talking about so we use I mean CRM um, oh, yeah. we've got multiple websites and landing pages that we're developing constantly um, not just the main elite property website, also, you know, elite commercial, elite vacations, our holiday homes division. Um, so, yeah, also in terms of holiday homes, obviously, you've got some of the software that you talk about all the time, Price Labs, Airbnb, mm. Booking.com. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Are, so those are the softwares, yeah. Yeah, that, that's the software. Um, we also have, you know, many, many different yeah. softwares that we, that we implement. Yeah, so so I bet also since you have like twenty five agents mm. that you you're you're managing, they're always asking you questions, right? They're yeah. always and you got a bunch of more employees. How how do you handle all of that? So now we've got we've got area managers. So we we've we've promoted a few of our, our best agents okay. um, who started with us, you know, from from the beginning in twenty twenty one. So we promoted them into area managers where they have their own area, it might be, you know, the Palm Jumeirah, downtown, different teams. So we, we've okay. had a kind of structural change. Because you were just overwhelmed with it? <laughs> yeah, what? and it just felt like, you know, when you get to a certain point of you, you grow you know, to a certain size, you need to have more management in position, more support. Yeah. Um, so we, yeah, we implemented a few area managers. So the agents, and, like, don't go to you directly, they go to the area manager first yeah. if they have questions or... Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they go to the area manager for, for more support. They can still come to us. Mm. Um, but we just we just needed more more managerial support. So I I bet yeah, yeah yeah. So what what are the things are you doing? You're probably doing a lot of research, like trying to understand what markets are good, what developers or yeah. something like that. Yeah, constantly meeting with developers every single week. You yeah. know, building our relationships with developers, finding out exactly what's what's being launched. Mm. Um, we all you know always searching the market for good investment opportunities for our for our private networks as well okay. um yeah a lot a lot of research we're also you know looking at getting a new crm for the company crm that's yeah. like a system where you can organize everything you can yeah all of the clients yeah and, man you know. i remember when i was an insurance broker yeah i was a really good one in iceland and I, <laughs> crm was the key for me i just yeah. every person i was trying to sell i had in the crm moved them around yeah that's key that's key and then we you know we, we want to get a crm where we can implement AI. So oh. we're, we're trying to figure out how we can utilize AI in our mm. real estate agency. Um, so we've got a few different ideas, um, but I think you know that's that's huge. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. same with holiday homes. You've got your virtual assistants and yeah. You know, price labs and you know, there's mm. a lot of AI involved. Um, so we we want to implement that as well into the brokerage. Yeah. Mm. I started using uh, Monday.com. Uh, you've probably heard of it. Mm. It's a CRM because now. I'm up to 14 apartments that I'm subleasing in Dubai. Yeah. And it was like the first time it was getting a little bit overwhelming because I was like furnishing two apartments. There was one I was waiting for the contract and then there were a couple that I had to do the photo shoots. Mm. So I like set it up in monday.com where I like, you know, I can yeah. move them around where each apartment is in the process and okay. save all the uh, files for each apartment. So, yeah. so that was pretty good. Okay. So you're on what, number 14 now? Yep. How long, how long has that been since you... Because I remember not long ago, you were only on two or three units, right? Yeah. So so before uh, I stopped working at your company, which was like September probably, yeah. I only had maybe three, I think. Mm. And then like since then, I've been just been scaling, scaling it up. Obviously, I, there were so many things I had to learn first and make sure everything was working and it was yeah. going to be profitable. But as soon as I saw okay, this is going to be profitable with the way I'm doing it. Mm. Then I, you know, expanded. And then I ran into a little bit of money problems because you need so much money to set things up. But now I've kind of figured that out a little bit better as well. So Mm. I'm going to just going to be expanding like crazy now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what, so going back to, you know, buying property in Dubai. Yeah. What's the, so 
you're just worried about the risks of, of owning property or is it, is it down to the amount of down payment or what? It's the down payment. Down payments, yeah. So, so obviously for me to set up apartments, I, I mean, need a lot less money setting up apartments when I sublease because mm. then I just have to buy the furniture, yeah. pay the agent and the security deposit. But, you know, the thing with Dubai is you have to put down 40%. Yeah. You, 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 isn't, isn't that right? You can buy one apartment with yeah. an 80% mortgage. Yeah. But then you have to put it down 60%. Yeah, exactly. On the second second property. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing why I like Iceland better because I can get 75% mortgage mm. as much as I want. Mm. You know? Yeah. Do you oh, gotta, so even if you have three, four yeah. properties, 75%. As many as you want. Really? And then you can get the seller to le lend you as well. Yeah. And so I got a 75% mortgage from the bank and mm. then I ask the eight, the owner that's selling me the apartment, I say, what if I pay you, you know, 10 or 15% after five years? Yeah. And I'll give you a little ex higher purchase price. So that way I have like a 90 or 95% mortgage. So it's so much mm. easier to leverage. Yeah. But here it's like almost impossible to do any, yeah. Yeah, anything true. like that. Yeah. So unless you're buying with cash. I mean, you you were looking at getting an investor as well, right? Yes. That if if I would get investors that would bring the forty percent in mm. for me, then totally I would be yeah. all in doing that for sure. Yeah. Mm. Is is that a thing here that like investors invest in people that buy apartments? Have you heard heard of that? No, I mean, obviously with with your business, I think you've been you've been looking for an investor for your you know Airbnb business. So I, I was just wondering from that that point of view, if mm -hmm. you if you you know if you did find an investor, for example, that you were pitching to before. Was that going to be the model where you were buying property or, or you would still be subleasing? Yeah, so the, the investor uh, I have now, or actually I have two contacts that are, are helping me with this now, is you know you know how you have to pay the rent up front here in Dubai? You yeah. don't usually pay it monthly. Mm -hmm. so, so that, or you pay, I oh, usually okay. negotiate with the owner that I can pay four payments over the year. Yeah. But that, let, that way I still have to pay three months rent up front. So yeah. that takes a lot of capital. But now these investors, I'm having them pay the rent for me, mm. and then I pay them back monthly, uh, with a little, you know, on top. Okay. So that Definitely. way I don't have to worry about that. I just have to spend on the furniture. Yeah. And I'm getting really good deals now on furniture. Mm. So now I can set up apartments much cheaper than ever before. How how are you standing out from the crowd? I mean, because you've got you know certain holiday home companies here, you know, such as Blue Ground. I think there's a few others which have got you know 800, 900 units on the market. How how are you you know standing out? You mean compared I, to those? You mean as the my properties on Airbnb? Yeah, like yeah. So obviously there's a bunch of uh, good holiday home operators in Dubai, yeah, and yeah. those stand out. And it's hard for me to stand out even more, but yeah. I just have to make sure that I am in the top ten or twenty percent. Yeah. And the way I do it is I just put in like quality good furniture. I spend mm. more on furniture than most other people. Mm. And then it's just taking the best photos possible yeah. and not just take 15 or 20 po photos. Mm. Just take like 60 40, or, or yeah. 60, yeah. Just go crazy with it. Just a yeah. lot of photos. Mm. And you know, and then it's just maximizing every single thing, like yeah. better descriptions, better, you know, mm. captions on the listing. Just, yeah. yeah, just do everything to stand out. But, but the think, biggest part is the photos and the furniture. Yeah, I think one thing that I noticed about you when you you were working at Elite, um, you were very analytical. Oh, so yeah. very your your feasibility studies. You know, mm. in the units that you're you're going to sublease, for example, you would look at every single number. You know, you've got oh. your your Excel sheets. You're really yeah. very very um, very smart in yeah. you know kind of feasibility studies. Because you don't just take you know units in every single area, you yeah. you, you actually analyze every single you know yeah. number and to make sure you can you can reach a certain profit, you know. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's the thing with Dubai. You can't just take any apartment. You have to find you know ch good cheap apartments yeah. and maybe something that makes them stand out to tourists. Maybe yeah. it's a really good pool mm. or you know just a really good view. Something that you know, the tourist value more than the, the long-term tenant. Yeah. So, and, and something that I can present really well in the photos, in the first yeah. four photos, because that's mm. what the tourists are actually looking yeah. at. So yeah, that's... How's it work? I mean, would you, would you look at taking units in, for example, areas like Beachfront or Blue Waters? Obviously, very, very attractive for tourists. You know, you've got beach, yeah. private beach, you know, all the tourist facilities, but in terms of, you know, paying the rent to the landlord, the rent's a lot higher than obviously, I know areas like downtown views and areas where you've got units. 
do you still see enough room to make profit there or i think you can make most things work mm. uh, but what i think is i've just i saw i could make it work the best in downtown and business mm. bay so that's just where i've been all in at. Yeah. now i took my first apartment in marina yeah just because i want to see how much profit i can actually make there uh but i think imar beachfront and blue waters they're so attractive for people to live in just yeah. long term. Mm. So the long term rent is very high. Mm. So if you want to sublease there, you have to get like a really, really good deal. Mm. Uh, but it's it, it's probably possible. Yeah. yeah. And I'll probably will at some point do it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one thing we've noticed as well, like long term rent, because it's increased so much. Mm. It's actually now competing with the holiday homes yeah. return. So, I mean, there, there was even an article on I think Forbes or Arabian Business where we were saying that long-term rent is actually more um, profitable than holiday home mm. rent, you know, for landlords. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing that we've noticed. So I think it really depends on, like you said, the area and the project. Yeah, um, but also it just depends so much on the holiday home operator as yeah. well. Because yeah. if you are a, a, a management company that's running 400 apartments, yeah. and you know the 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 big brain, the good you know person that started this company, he mm. he's not involved in every single apartment he's got you know agents running these apartments for him yeah. and the agents are not perfect they cannot they or they don't know how to truly maximize the the profits or maybe they just don't care so it's yeah. it's if if you're subleasing you can put your whole heart and all your efforts into maximizing you know mm. the rents so you can make that profit yeah. but but i can totally understand that you know if you own an apartment and you give it to a holiday home management company yeah in many cases, you're not gonna make any more, obviously because you have to give the agent, uh, yeah, the yeah. company 15 or 20%, yeah. Yeah. but also they're not gonna pour their heart and soul into that unit, you yeah. know what I mean? Mm. Like I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah true. Yeah, Are you, do you spend like, every, so every day, you know, analyzing the units you've got, changing settings, or how, how much work do you actually put into? Yeah, the so, so obviously, I mean, if I go back to like my apartments in Iceland, when mm. I when I started there, yeah, every day I was just analyzing, cracking numbers. But then mm. as I grew, I I you know, and I started to know the market better, and I set my settings well. Mm. And then I moved to Dubai. I'm getting so comfortable with the Icelandic market that I spend maybe just twice a week I look at it and mm. you know change the settings a little bit, the prices. But in Dubai, I'm still so new in Dubai that yeah, pretty much every day I'm checking the numbers. Yep. making improvements also just because i i've never experienced february in dubai i've never experienced march in dubai yeah but you know next year when i have experienced these months i'm mm. going to be a lot more comfortable and i would have to spend less time you know yeah trying to understand yeah what changes i have to make yeah and i noticed you so you were talking in some of your videos before about the the summer months mm. in dubai so mm. i think you you've already started receiving bookings right yeah so so obviously the summer months are a lot worse Mm. in Dubai than the winter months when yeah. it comes to uh, Airbnb. But what I've done is just set my apartments at a very competitive rate very early. Yeah. Like right now, they're already, if you go on Airbnb, you search two bedroom apartment in downtown, my apartment is gonna come very top. Yeah. It's gonna be one of the best deals in the market. Yeah. So, so my apartment has so much time to actually get booked because mm. it's already one of the best deals in the market. So I am getting booked, I'm probably maybe like, 10 or 20 percent booked in the summer already yeah uh, um, but you've adjusted the prices right to, yeah. to get the bookings yeah, yeah exactly i lowered them a lot yeah but uh but but the thing is when, once you come to the say you're in june already and you know the next week you're you don't have any bookings you're gonna have to lower your price so much just because everybody is panicking and they're everybody's low and they're lowering their price so yeah. then you're in such a price war with everybody yeah and then you have to lower the price even more than what you have to do now to mm. actually get bookings yeah but you know it's all like just testing and theories yeah. and you know i'm not an expert in this i'm just you know yeah documenting what i'm doing yeah but i think the amount of detail that you go into i mean yeah. you, you spoke about obviously your listing being on the front page all the time um you go into a lot of detail i know yeah. everything is you know bit of a perfectionist i think yeah. of your listings so, i guess so yeah yeah for sure. so you know making sure it's same with property finder you know you've mm. got to make sure you're on the front pages for the projects yeah. where you're focusing on because you know that's how you're going to catch the most leads or the yeah. most bookings in, in terms of holiday homes right yeah exactly man mm. yeah true so what is <laughs> 
do you have any crazy stories as a real estate agent in Dubai? Some like weird stuff that happened to you? Crazy, <laughs> crazy stories. No, I, I mean, know. you must have. You've been in 11 <laughs> years and there's so many people with a lot of money in Dubai. Nothing? Nothing crazy? No, not really. No, nothing that I can, can think of that's... Because I mean, most, most of my, my business has been off plan, right? So yeah. even a lot of the time we were dealing with clients that were not even in Dubai, we're not even meeting face to face. So we're doing a lot of transactions over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot more stories in the secondary market where yeah. you're, you're doing viewings face to face. I've heard of you know, some, some very funny stories, but for me, yeah. it's mainly, mainly off plan. Yeah, I remember yeah. when I was working in your company that uh, one of the agents, he went on the balcony somewhere. Yeah. He was alone and the balcony door closed it closed and he oh. locked himself out and it was yeah. 50 degrees outside yeah yeah and he, he was, was on the balcony and he was locked there for like <laughs> and he was like texting people in the company trying to get them to open up yeah but nobody had time to do it so he like offered people money yeah, yeah, to yeah. come let him out yeah no one would no one would save him yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i forgot about that that was i think it was last year right uh, uh, yeah probably like august or something yeah in the heat yeah <laughs> All right, man. So, what, what's your what's your kind of goal? I mean, obviously, you want to get to a hundred units. Yeah. In you know subleasing, um, where do you see yourself going after that? I mean, once you get to that one hundred. Yeah. So honestly, I don't think I'm going to be subleasing forever because mm. I see you know the long term benefits in buying apartments is actually a lot better. I feel like just mm. because of the appreciation of the apartment and uh, yeah. you're paying down the loan and all that. Mm. So I think I'm going to be going to a hundred apartments here in Dubai yeah. and then I'm gonna you know use that cash flow mm. to transition over to buying whether that that's here in Dubai or maybe I'll move to like America somewhere where I can do the creating creative finance thing I mm. talked about earlier yeah. where I can like leverage a little more mm. uh, but you know also I'm just taking like every, one month at a time and you know it, I got scared a little bit for a while because I felt like rents in Dubai were racing so much yeah. I was having a harder time finding profitable deals yeah but now I feel like it's slowing down a little bit. So I'm mm. like, okay, I can still do profitable deals. And also yeah. summer's coming. So I'm going to be able to, probably it's going to be even easier to negotiate with landlords. Yeah. So I'm just taking every month at a time. I mean, it could come at a point where I get to like 40 apartments and I just don't feel like it's making sense anymore. Mm. Then I'll just stop. I'll do my 40 apartments and then yeah. I'll start doing something else. Yeah. So, and would you, would you look at moving to other markets? I mean, would you go to America or, you know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, you know, I'll stay in Dubai as long as I see that I'm making good profits. Yeah. But if something changes, yeah, then I'm probably going to be moving somewhere else. Yeah. And that's probably going to be America. Yeah. 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 But I mean, I might test, test like Abu Dhabi. I might, yeah. I might test that. I've heard you can sublease there and make profit. Really? Yeah. He okay. said, the guy in Silk House, he's Silk House, he said they were. Didn't they introduce like new laws in New York regarding subleasing? Yeah. What, what was, what was that? Uh, I don't know exact, exactly, but I think it's like all over America and all over Europe, there's these regulations. And this mm. is the good thing with Dubai. It's like very clear regulations that you can just rent out on Airbnb as long as you want. Yeah. Like in Iceland, you can, in most places, you can only rent out 90 days every year. Mm. And and in America, like cities like New York, I, I think it's, you can only rent for 30 days or more. Yeah. So you cannot put your apartment on airbnb and just rent it out for seven days or three days okay yeah i i think that's the reason okay. and there's a bunch of rules like that all over america yeah. but you just have to figure out what markets yeah, are yeah. airbnb friendly you know mm, i yeah. hear like all over florida and miami yeah. you can rent as much as you want for okay. example yeah yeah, yeah i know because in like i think south of france has got regulations on you know you can only airbnb your apartment for like a couple of months of the year yeah to protect you know the yeah. residents and in the cities um so yeah it's interesting do you think do you think they'd ever introduce something like that in dubai to you probably not better than <laughs> me, right? i don't know i don't know but yeah. you know i've not right, seen it's a, it's a it's a big risk right if they, if they yeah. did yeah yeah for sure what do you think hmm i i don't think they will no 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 because i i think i think that gets introduced when residents start making big complaints yeah you know and complaining about you know airbnb apartments but 
you know, landlords are making very good returns on even long-term rent. You know, the yields are high. Mm -hmm. So I don't see why they would be, you know, yeah. complaining. Yeah, I've seen no indication of that. I've never even heard that being mentioned or talked mm. about at all. No. And also, I, I'm like shocked how neighbors mm. don't care about Airbnb at all. Like mm. in Iceland, and you hear this in America as well, it's just like neighbors are always like cursing Airbnb and just like yeah. crazy mad and... You know, I've had a lot of problems with that in Iceland. But here, yeah. neighbors, it's just a part of Dubai. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like True. they don't even think about it. Mm. So that's that's the good thing about Airbnb in Dubai. I feel like, you know, on my Instagram, I make it seem very easy what I'm doing. Mm. And I think a lot of people want to do a similar thing. Yeah, it's not it's not easy at all. It's definitely not easy. And I think Dubai <laughs> is probably a harder market to do this in versus UK, America, or yeah. most of Europe. Mm. But Dubai is very good for like advanced operators because yeah. if you can actually make your apartment profitable, mm. then it's so easy to scale. It's so easy to get more apartments. And yeah. you know, it's so easy to delegate because labor is cheap and good mm. employees here and, and neighbors don't bother you and regulations won't bother you and, and all that, you know? Yeah. But it's very hard to become profitable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So why, why do you think it's, it's better here than like the UK, for example, was subleasing? Um, I mean, I don't think it's easier. Mm. I think it's harder. Mm. But like I mentioned, it's more scalable if yeah. you can make it better. Yeah. I think it's harder because of the regulations. Because the regulations are so easy or, or friendly that mm. there are just so many apartments on Airbnb that the comp competition is just so so high. Versus like I did a podcast with a guy from Chicago. Yeah. And there, there's regulations that only six apartments per building can go on Airbnb. Mm. So obviously that's very hard to get, you know, into these apartments and put them on Airbnb. But if you get actually get these apartments, they're going to be very profitable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, starting out in one of these markets where, you know, the regulations are a little bit of a gray area and, you know, that's a lot yeah. easier than starting here in Dubai. Yeah. Because I think if you start subleasing in Dubai with no holiday home experience, mm. you're not going to make any money. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, definitely, yeah, very, very competitive. Yeah, for market. sure. Um, and how do you compare it to like Iceland? Like, is there, is there a lot of competition in Iceland or? Mm, not really. No. I think, I mean, there's like one professional company that does it very well. But mm. other than that, it's just all like mom and pops people just doing yeah. it, you know? So mm. there's no like big competition. But the thing is, there are very few apartments and areas that are allowed to go and be on Airbnb the whole year. Yeah. So that also makes it very profitable when you can get those units mm. but the bad thing with iceland is th those rules might change at any time you know yeah and i don't want to be expanding like crazy in iceland and then the regulations will change yeah. and then i'm left with like 100 apartments worth of furniture and i'm like what do i do with yeah. all this <laughs> you know so yeah. that's the thing but you yeah. you are uh you have a holiday home uh department in yeah. your company as well how many apartments yeah. do you have now so now we're like 35 units nice okay yeah um, so that's mainly, I mean, obviously we were doing off plan many years ago. So we had a lot of investors or clients that bought property with us. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, once it's finished, they wanted us to manage it for them. Yeah. So, you know, it offers a lot more flexibility. So most of our, our clients are, you know, they bought as a holiday home. They want to use the unit for two, three months a year, maybe mm -hmm. they block the calendar. Um, and then, you know, holiday home management offers them that flexibility where, they can, you know, still use the apartment, but then yeah. have it have it generating income in the other months when they're not here as well. Yeah. Um, so, it, yeah, it's not it's not our main focus, the holiday homes, but it, it's something that we need to to service our, you know, elite property clients because, mm. yeah, it's an important part of the business. Yeah, you want to be like a full package when it comes to real estate. Yeah, right? exactly. You know, not just holiday homes, the commercial, um, long term rentals mm -hmm. as well. Um, so we, we tried to have everything under the same the same roof. Yeah, it sounds like you grew uh, a little bit. When I was with you, you had 20 apartments. Yeah. And now you have 35. Do you yeah. see now that it's getting a little harder to manage all these? Or do you have like good systems in place? I think from obviously your time elite where you introduced, you know, Price Labs, for example, um, the channel management, um, Hostify, which we're using. Mm -hmm. um, now we've now we've worked all of the you know the software out and got everything all of nice. the settings working correctly awesome. i think a lot of it a lot of it now is automated nice. um so mainly you know managing the the landlords and the owners is the hardest part really yeah i mean because you know it's the same you know real estate is always 
you know, managing the buyer or managing the seller. That's yeah. that's kind of the the hard work. Subleasing, obviously, we've got units in downtown views that we're subleasing as well. Yeah, and that's you know, you're you're just paying the landlord the rent. You don't have to deal with the owner anymore. You know, yeah. then you're you're just so much easier. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so much easier. So that that's kind of you know, once you've got all the settings and the software set up, yeah. it's just managing the landlords. And you are know, you talking sure. to the landlords, or do you have somebody? No, so we have for that? we have holiday homes agents as well, yeah. and then we have holiday homes admin. Um, then we've got a maintenance team, cleaning company. Um, so yeah, so a lot of a lot of people think you know, okay, I can just set up a holiday homes company, and mm. but you need you need to have every single. Um, department covered right so you mm. know already cleaning maintenance mm -hmm. virtual assistance channel management yeah because you know one one bad review can can yeah, damage yeah. your you know your listing so much exactly um, and you know the holiday homes guests are you know they've got high expectations they're yeah. coming on holiday they want everything to be perfect so you really need to make sure that you're not getting any bad reviews so mm -hmm. you need to have the right the right team managing the units mm. yeah. so so obviously there's these two models when it comes to an Airbnb business. You can either sublease like I am. Yeah. You just rent apartments, put them on Airbnb and you take all the profit. Yeah. Or you can manage apartments for other people and you split the profits with the, yeah. with the owner. You primarily do that. How much of a percentage do you charge of the profits or the revenue? Yeah, so we charge a 20% management fee. Okay. And then we also charge 25% um, for like, you know, platinum membership. Mm. Um, which has different perks involved, um, and that's that's kind of the the market average, you know, twenty twenty to twenty five percent. But yeah, we are looking to get more subleasing units now. Nice. Um, just finding you know the right projects and the right owners that we can we can work with. Nice. On that. What area yeah. are you thinking about? Uh, we're look, thinking at JBR. Okay. Yeah, JBR um, Marina. Obviously, Palm Jumeirah, we, we would love, but yeah. you know the long the, the problem is landlords now the rents have gone up so much yeah. and they're a lot less flexible on checks, yeah. right? So landlords want in you know you know yourself one in one check payment mm. or two check payments. You really need to be getting, I prefer four you know four checks in mm. terms of cash flow. I mean, yeah. what what do you normally aim for? Four four, four checks? checks. Yeah, yeah. I got twelve checks the other day. No way. Yeah, but I I, I had to pay an extra ten thousand dirhams in rent, but yeah. I thought it was worth it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's... But usually four checks is the what well, you can get without like having to pay extra. Yeah, 12 checks. Yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty rare. Um, Fair, yeah. What what unit is it? It's it's uh, Business Bay, the the tower with the pool, infinity pool on top. Okay. But yeah. how it went is I got it directly from the owner. The yeah. owner just sent me a, uh, a message on Instagram yeah. and I met with him mm. and we agreed on four checks. Mm. And then I told him I was going to get an investor, you know, to pay. Yeah. To pay the rent for for me, and I'll pay him monthly. Mm. And then he said, "Just how much are you paying the investor?" And I said, "I'm like six percent extra or something." Mm. And he said, "Just pay, just pay me six percent extra, yeah. and I'll give you the twelve checks." And mm. I was like, "All right." So you actually got that landlord through the Instagram channel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't have to pay the agent a commission yeah. on that deal. Yeah. So that helped a lot. There's just so many reasons where this social media thing has helped me. Yeah. Like it's crazy. Yeah. So going back to that, obviously we spoke about it at the start. Yeah. Um, so you're you're getting a lot of opportunities and a lot more advantages from just the social media channel, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Both uh, just you know getting better deals with the furnishing companies. You know, agents are more eager to work with me, and mm. you know I get more credibility from homeowners, mm. uh, and just being able to connect with people. Uh, you know, yeah. I've uh, I've connected with people that are just running like 300 Airbnbs, like so many of them, and I learn so much from them, and I can ask them for help, and you know. Yeah, it's it's crazy mm. how how it helps. What's the most valuable lessons you've learned from so some of your guests that you know, like you said, managing 300, 400 units? Mm. What have you learned from from these guests? Like valuable lessons that you, that you would say? <sighs> Man, it's hard hard to say, but you know, yeah. so many things. Just you know about just improving little things mm. like pricing, how to furnish a little better, you yeah. know, and like operations probably most mm. like how you know i've spoken to two guys in america that have over 300 apartments and just seeing their virtual assistant uh, operations so mm. both of them have like people working for them in the philippines yeah and both of them have like 25 people and they only have to pay them like five dollars an hour and they have like leaderships 
structure within the group and just how organized everything is. 25 virtual assistants. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then there's like leaders within that group that hire more people and are in charge of that people. And those are people that they have never even met. You know, yeah. it's all just like through Zoom and through, yeah. through the phone. So probably, yeah, just like how the entire structure works really. Yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but then there's probably a lot of things that I'm forgetting, like little things. Yeah, and, yeah, of course. But also just, you know, being able to just send them a message on WhatsApp if I have like a little question, you know, yeah, that helps a lot. But then once you get to say, say you got to 300 units in Dubai, yeah, that's, you know, paying checks, multiple checks for every single unit. Mm -hmm. There's potentially a lot of risk as well, right? So for example, say if something like COVID happens again, yep. you know, they stop traveling. Mm. But yeah, I mean, how how would you protect yourself in a situation like that? Yeah, so obviously subleasing is a lot more risky than yeah. managing apartments for owners. Uh, so I'd say, you know, that is a risk. If COVID happened again, mm. it's possible that things would get very difficult. But the thing is, Dubai, I think I could possibly survive because Dubai stayed relatively open during COVID mm -hmm. and you know yeah it would be hard but yeah. I would just I would figure it out I would like yeah. negotiate with the landlords I would mm -hmm. uh, you know try to uh, get tenants in for longer term you know yeah. but honestly yeah it would be Special hard. Special offers and yeah, yeah. Yeah it would definitely be hard if COVID happened exactly yeah. like like it did but that's that's also a big reason why I don't want to be subleasing forever mm. I want to get to a point where I start you know diversifying into something else yeah because if I'm always expanding always spending my profits on new furniture new furniture and uh, I want to you know at some point stop and just take care of that portfolio and then you know diversifying into other things that are maybe less risky yeah. you know mm. or you know somehow start starting to manage apartments for other people and have a blended portfolio of subleasing and management, yeah, uh, that might lower the risk as well. Yeah, But honestly, yeah, yeah it would I, be hard. I for think sure. you can take confidence in knowing, obviously, what, what happened in Dubai during COVID and seeing how Dubai reacted. I think you can take a lot of confidence from that. And, you know, exactly. there's a, yeah, there's a lot less risk here. I think if you look at, like, I mean, Europe and UK, they were in lockdown for a, a lot longer Mm -hmm. time period right so yeah exactly felt like i mean two years or you know yeah uh, here it was you know very very quick mm -hmm. so i think you can take confidence in that yeah the mm -hmm. guy that i spoke to from chicago with 300 units he said uh he he went through COVID and he managed to survive mm. and you know i spoke to him um, about that and you know he like renegotiated with the landlords and mm -hmm. he he changed some of the deals with the landlords to revenue share yeah like he did all kinds of things to survive and is, does that have to be in your contract that your subleasing contract though for if you were to renegotiate the contract is, is there any kind of clauses that you you can put in yeah you could put a clause in like um uh, i know one guy that's subleasing in dubai he puts a clause in each one of his deals yeah. saying if the regulations change in dubai mm. regarding airbnb then yeah. he's allowed to pull out okay so yeah. so that's a good thing to do i don't do that mm. yet but i mm. might might yeah. actually do that mm. So, so yeah, it's definitely, definitely risky, mm. but, uh, yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. You have two subleasing deals. Yeah. Those are actually, when I was working with you, I actually found those deals. Yeah, you did. These were f four <laughs> units that we took together. Yeah. I took two of them. You took two of them. Yeah. Really good deals. Yeah. I think like the rents, we got them for like, we're paying like 130 dirhams per year yeah. for each apartment. Four and checks. Four checks, and the rents yeah. now are like one sixty or higher, so they've risen. Uh, mm. So that, those were good deals. Yeah. So let's talk about a little bit about that. So, so April twenty twenty three, I came for a job interview in yeah. with Elite Properties. Yeah. I uh, the interview. Uh, you know, I got to <laughs> tell you a story. Yeah, go it's on. funny. <laughs> so, so. I, I came to Dubai just for a visit. I've, I dreamt of moving to Dubai. Like I, I, I wasn't sure that subleasing was gonna work, yeah. but I wanted to get a job somewhere just to you know hang out with a bunch of people, you mm -hmm. know potentially make good money and learn about Airbnb in Dubai. And I had a, a an interview with another company in Dubai, yeah. uh, Holiday Home Agency, and they offered me just very very low salary, no commission, yeah. and 
and they wanted me to stay for a long time and I only saw myself staying for a short period with that, you know, yeah. structure. And then after that interview, I was like, yeah, okay, I don't know what I'm doing here. This is never going to work. Yeah. And then I had an interview with, with you guys yeah. and I actually had no idea even what the job was. <laughs> I was like, oh, I have this interview tomorrow. And I, I was even thinking about like not going. Yeah. And then I went, I Reese in your company interviewed me yeah, recruitment manager. and she just sold me. Yeah. <laughs> she was t telling me how the salary structure was as a real yeah. estate agent and I was like doing my calculations I was like wow you can make so much money as a real estate agent in Dubai if you're actually good yeah. and I was you know uh, an insurance broker in Iceland before mm. I like before like years before and I was like probably the best agent in Iceland for many years and I was yeah. making good money so I think what's stopping me from just being one of the best agents in Dubai and yeah. then I had my second interview with you and you were telling me about all this salary structures and, you know, the bonuses. And yeah, you just sold me on being an agent. And then I was like, all right, I'm moving here. I'm becoming a real estate agent. <laughs> you know, it's going to be great. But yeah, do you, do you remember that interview? That yeah, we did? I remember it well, yeah. I was... Why did you decide to uh, hire me? So I could, see, I could see that you were, you know, there was something different about you with your, the experience you had in holiday homes. Yeah. Um, from that point, I could see, you know, like I said, going back to how analytical you were, mm. the feasibility studies you were doing, the software you knew about, different software that we, we didn't even have yet. Yeah. Um, so it was mainly, yeah, your knowledge, and I could see the potential that, that you had. Yeah, nice. um, and obviously, you know, it goes to show from what you're doing now yeah, with your so. subleasing channel. Yeah. Um, but I could see also that, yeah, you're, you're very kind of, um, what's the word? You're very, very focused, but mm. also you don't really work in teams. You know, you're very like yeah. focused on your own, mm. um, your own units, your own, like an agent would. But yeah, you, I could see that you were very, very focused on subleasing as opposed to the management side of the business. Yeah. Um, so what, why, why did you choose? Cause obviously, you were planning to be subleasing when you moved to Dubai, right? So mm. what, was, what was the reason for also looking at like working as a real estate agent? Yeah, so originally the plan was, because I wasn't 100% sure that subleasing was going to work. Mm. So I wanted to come to Dubai, work for an Airbnb business, just to learn everything. To learn it, yeah. But then I kind of gave up on that idea. Uh, but then when you sold me on the idea of becoming a real estate agent, yeah. I thought I was just going to become a real estate agent yeah. for years. <laughs> uh, and then maybe yeah. sublease on the side. Yeah. So, so I start working with you okay. in Elite, yeah. and you know I'm mainly focused on the holiday home operations, mm. Mm. and you know. But the thing is, once you like, I was super interested in get, getting back into working in a company and yeah. like with people in an yeah. office because I'd done that before yeah. for like three years. Yeah. Uh, but in between, I started working for myself. I started mm. growing my own business. I'm working alone. You know, made good money on my own. Yeah. And going from that to working with people and for people again, yeah. it's a hard transition. Yeah, yeah. You know, course, yeah. imagine you, yourself yeah, going yeah. back to the real estate agency, and yeah. you know, mm. because the problem was, you know, I, you know, I saw like your company was amazing. There were mm. so many fun things, you know, so many good things. Yeah. But and Thank you. and I wanted to go a certain direction with the holiday home operations, yeah. and I just wanted to go, you know, just you know. Yeah. <laughs> blow this thing up you know yeah but then there's you know like you have to go through this person management and you have yeah. to go through that yeah. person yeah. and it's like and then you have like like some like people fighting for power and you know yeah, it's yeah. A ego here and there you know it's just like it's, yeah. it was impossible you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so but obviously you know i'm some 27 year old from iceland yeah. that wants to like change everything obviously it's going to be hard you know yeah yeah of course yeah. yeah. So that's that was the problem. So so why did you uh, end up firing me? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know it was it wasn't it wasn't a personal thing. Of course, you? I think you know that. Yeah. Um, but it was it was a, a time in the company where we had grown so much, um, mm. where we had to basically try to get rid of. We 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 wanted to get everyone on the same page. You know, we had we had different agents different people working in the company where there was just people doing their own thing and you know we we're all about working you know as one yeah um it's very hard to get to when you get bigger but we we had to get rid of certain people where you know, i could see with yourself you know you were very focused on subleasing getting your own units um so it was more about that you know just making sure everyone was on the same page working as a team 
Mm-hmm. Um, that that's very 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 important for elite, you know, and that's why we've got area managers in place now, trying to implement a lot more teamwork, a lot more deals within the company, um, and that that was it really. I could see the direction that you were going in. Um, I knew it was going to be very very successful, but it was just how can we make money together? Yeah, because your subleasing was like you know, it was very very hard to make money of two unless we were obviously investing, putting in the money and putting down the checks. But you didn't need us to do that, you know. It was yeah. So it was more about that, you know. How how could we make money together? Yeah. Yeah. yeah obviously, man. I I I saw it coming for sure. Mm. I uh, cause I I was. I I was starting to sublease on my own while yeah. working for like you knew while working for uh, yeah. your company, and yeah. most of my focus had turned to that. Yeah. And you probably saw that I was not showing up to the office as much. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. you know, then you sent me that <laughs> message. You know, after yeah. one month of that. Yeah, yeah. And you know, yeah, it's, it was. It, yeah, and again, you got to think of like the new people that join us, yeah. you know, different agents, and then it's very important for us that they look at everyone else in the office and if somebody else is like not in the office or doing their own doing thing, their own thing yeah. that then they all, you'll have a group of agents that are like okay well I want to do my own thing yeah. or you know I'm not going to listen to your rules or you know yeah. and then so it's more about having a very very tight team yeah. everyone's on the same page everyone's working towards the same goals of course that's what we're we're trying to get to you know obviously yeah yeah and it was so it wasn't just you there was other people where we're like okay we can see they're doing that it's fine you know do your own thing mm-hmm. but we need to have an elite a strong team if we're gonna if we're gonna scale you know yeah obviously man yeah 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 it was uh it was very sad though because yeah. uh <laughs> i i i mean because you know i moved to dubai i had only been here for like three months yeah and you know, that was the only like group I had, you know, yeah. I, w- I wasn't like, I-, I didn't have, you know, people messaging me on, on social media at that time. Like, mm. so, so yeah, it was very sad not to uh, being able to go yeah, s- somewhere, yeah. but uh, I mean, I totally we're, get it. We're still friends though, man. Yeah, Sorry, yeah, not, wasn't sure. a bad, it wasn't a bad breakup. <laughs> yeah, exactly, man. <laughs> no, yeah, I could see, I could see from early on that, you know, the, the, the technology that you were using um, and the knowledge you had, obviously from the mm-hmm. subleasing you were doing in Iceland was, you know, unique compared to what what I had seen from you know people we'd hired in elite vacations or other holiday homes agents. I think I think it's very very it's a very tough market. You know, finding experienced holiday home you know managers um, is difficult. So you you came with a lot of new knowledge, new experience, which mm-hmm. was refreshing um, mm-hmm. and definitely helped elite vacations get to where it is now. Yeah. You know? So, but, but do you regret firing me? Would you Would you rather have <laughs> me still there? You know. Uh, do I regret? Um, well, it was yeah, kind of. I guess <laughs> I do. Uh, but it's just you know, it's just how 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 will we have yeah. done? I think unless we were subleasing together, it was like yeah. what what we were gonna do. You know, exactly. Obviously, it was great having you there in the office, and we were learning and stuff. But you know, it all comes down to obviously yeah, making man. money. You know, of course. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Good that we clear cleared that. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, last thing I wanted to talk to you about is just like, you know, the lifestyle in Dubai. I see yeah. you, uh, so I, I did wake surfing yeah. uh, a little back. I see you do wake surfing, but recently I've seen you do like... Jet surfing. Jet surfing. Yeah. What's the difference between jet surfing and wake surfing? So jet surfing is basically, it's basically a, like a wakeboard with like a motorbike engine. Or, yeah. or like, you know, go-karting engine inside. Uh-huh. So it can go up to like 65 kilometers an hour. Um, it's actually a... a a uh, company, I think a Czech or Croatian company that, that developed the jet surf. Okay. So, um, yeah, I got one of those and now I'm addicted. So you can just cruise around wherever you want? Yeah, you can go anywhere. You've probably seen like the e- e-foil boards, right? They've got like the, they come out of the water and oh. yeah, but they've got like a, a propeller at the bottom, like battery mm. packed. Uh, so these are petrol engines in the wow. jet surfs. Yeah. But what if it's like wavy? Is it fine, or do you have to go on days? Where yeah, it's I mean flat? you can jump. You can jump on the waves. Or, wow. Yeah. The other day I went all around the Palm Palm Jumeirah. You went around front. the Palm. Yeah, yeah. On your own. Yeah, yeah. No, with one of my friends, Chris. Okay. But you can't go on your own, just like. If no, you, if I mean you could take your phone in like a waterproof uh, pouch. Okay. You know, life jacket and everything. Yeah. But yeah, so you've got to make sure you've got enough uh, petrol and battery to, oh, yeah. to get around. So you don't have to swim home. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Man. That's but no, I mean the lifestyle you can have in Dubai. You've seen you know, yeah. the amount of 
the amount of fun. How long have you been here now? One year? Seven, eight months. Seven or eight months, yeah. yeah. And you're, I've seen, you know, you, you're doing a lot more, like you go to the gym, everything. The lifestyle yeah. here is, is yeah, the, the things you can do outdoors as well. Yeah, the biggest thing is like, you know, the, the amount of service you can get. It's just like you can get anything to your doorstep in like 15 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, I get my hair cut at home. I get, you know, cleaners. I get... Yep. You know, laundry, I get people to pick up my laundry. Like, I take Ubers everywhere. Just the standard of living is, it's like, yeah, so much higher. Yeah, yeah, true. But do, do you like the jet surfing more than wake surfing? Do I like jet surfing more? Um, yeah, because you don't need you don't need a boat pulling you along. Yeah. That, so you've got more freedom. You can go, you know, wherever you want. And you see you um, had to wear a helmet too? Could yeah, because, you know, you don't want to fall off at like 60, uh. 65 kilometers pretty pretty quick you know yeah. it's just like a speedboat so um yeah if you fall off at that speed you yeah. you don't want to get concussion right oh yeah so yeah, yeah you have to you have to wear a helmet if you're gonna go yeah. full speed well you should, you should come out um you know you, next you, couple of weeks can we go together yeah yeah sure shit man yeah. i want to do that yeah <laughs> let's for do sure, it man. let's do it yeah what what other fun things do you do in dubai so yeah it's a lot a lot of water sports um i own a jeep as well so i go out in the desert off-roading yeah nice um yeah, I mean that. That's I think Dubai's got so many. So you, many. You have that Mercy, the red Mercedes Benz. Are you talking about that one? No. So the Jeep Sahara um, oh, Wrangler. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh, my off-road Jeep. Yeah. Yeah. So I love going out, you know, off-road yeah. in that as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. All right, man. I think we've uh, talked about it all, man. Yeah. Any any th last things you want to mention? No, I think it was great, great coming on the channel, and uh, thank you for thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. What if uh, what if people want uh, to buy apartments or a property here in Dubai? How is it best to have you help them? With yeah, that? so they can reach out, obviously, um, on the on the details. I'm sure you'll put it on the, yes, on the video. Sure. I'll put it. Um, in the description. They can go to our new website, ElitePropertyDXB.com. Yeah. Um, and see our full range of services and properties that we've got available. All right. Yeah. Amazing, man. Thank you so much. Thanks man. a lot. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah, you too, man. Cheers.